Hello everyone, and welcome back to another lesson on the history of the Monster Hunter series. Today we'll be looking at the second generation of games, including Monster Hunter DOS, Freedom 2, and Freedom Unite. Some of the games that really started to make a name for themselves in the West. If you haven't watched my previous video talking about the first generation of Monster Hunter, I highly suggest that you do so now. Additionally, if you like these videos and want to help support the channel, please consider liking the video and subscribing. It just takes a couple of seconds and really helps boost the reach of the video to Monster Hunter fans everywhere. As someone who got into the Monster Hunter series through the third generation onward, it's interesting going back and revisiting the Portable series, as well as investing time into learning about Monster Hunter DOS for the PlayStation 2, a game that never made it to North America, and that has some unique content that hasn't reappeared in future games. By making this video and doing this research, I too am learning about the series as a whole and filling the gaps on the knowledge that I've never had or have lost through time. I'm not going to drag on with a long introduction. By looking at this script, I think that the length of this video is going to be long enough as it is. But I'll say this. Monster Hunter is a series where a very large portion of the content is not readily available to Western audiences. It is one of Japan's most popular and influential series, and has made a big name for itself globally with the release of World. But that wasn't always the case. It wasn't until the release of Monster Hunter Portable in 2005 that the series really began to take off in Japan. And it wouldn't be until the release of Freedom 2 in 2007 that the series finally exploded. It wouldn't be possible, or rather, it would be improbable that I could make these videos without the help of the Monster Hunter community. Through groups dedicated to the series, the lore, and preserving past content, it's possible for these videos to exist today. Thank you to the community as a whole. Monster Hunter DOS is, in my opinion, a definitive addition to the series, and one that really set in stone what the series would be moving forward. And I hope to show you why that is as we explore this generation of the Monster Hunter games. What led Monster Hunter to become the Capcom powerhouse it is today? And how did the series perform since its initial inception and release in 2004? In this multi-part video series, we'll take a look at all five generations of the Monster Hunter franchise, as well as Frontier, Monster Hunter Online, and several other spin-off games that have been developed. I'm Super Rad. And today, I'm here to bring you a brief history of Monster Hunter, second generation. After the development of Monster Hunter 1 and Monster Hunter G, the series appeared on portable consoles with the release of Monster Hunter Freedom in 2005. But Freedom wasn't the only game being developed by Capcom at the time. While the company wanted to expand into portable gaming, an ever-growing market in Japan, they continued to work on the next full entry in the series, Monster Hunter DOS for the PS2, which would release in 2006, just one year after the release of Portable. Despite its small, cult following in the West, the series still got press from sites like IGN, who covered its announcement all the way up to its release. Clearly, there was some interest in the series. It's actually a bit amusing, there's even an article where IGN tells you you're wrong for calling it Monster Hunter 2 instead of DOS, speculating that it would be called 2 in its English release. Unfortunately, that English release never happened. Due to subpar sales and lack of interest in the West, Capcom decided not to release it over here. In 2013, Ryozo Sujimoto, who became the series producer, starting with Monster Hunter Freedom 2, is even quoted as saying, When you look at the history of the Monster Hunter franchise in the West, you can't really say that it's been a huge success. However, this didn't stop them from developing something great for Japanese audiences. To call Monster Hunter 2 ambitious is a bit of an understatement. The amount of changes and concepts designed for this specific entry are staggering. There's a bit of a disconnect between Western audiences and the series since the game never made it over to North America, some even claiming that it is just Monster Hunter 1 with a few additions. But is that the case? Well, no. In fact, DOS is what shaped the series to be what it is today, with many of its core concepts and additions persisting through the series all the way up to World. But that doesn't mean there aren't a few bad eggs in there. For example, let's take a deeper look at the time of day and seasonal system. Monster Hunter 2 was the first game in the series to implement a day and night cycle. The cycle affects monster spawns, quests, and even the environment. 
If it's daytime in the desert zones, you'll need a cold drink to keep cool, but if it's nighttime, it's noticeably colder, and hot drinks are required to stay warm. That's a pretty cool addition, and one that adds a little immersion to the series without inhibiting the player too much. On the other end of the concept are seasons. Monster Hunter 2 contains three seasons that change dynamically as you complete quests within the game. First, hot or warm season, where carnivorous monsters are more active and more likely to be encountered. This season locks the player out of the desert zone hunting location, but generally offers more to hunt. Next is Cold Season, which, like Hot Season, also locks the player out of a hunting zone, this time the Snowy Mountains area. Monsters in this season become more aggressive, but as a trade-off, will have a better chance of dropping rare materials for the player. Finally, there's Breeding Season, where monsters go to… well, you know. And during this time, there will be more herbivores out and about, making this season an optimal time to go gathering. While this mechanic of seasons is an interesting addition and offers certain advantages to the player, it's hard not to notice how it also limits them, locking them out of specific areas, and by doing so, also locking them out of specific quests. And in a game that feels like it's all about player freedom, even going on to label its portable series as such, it was an addition that probably didn't receive a very good reception. We can infer this since the mechanic didn't even make it into the next game in the portable series, Freedom 2. If you are going into Monster Hunter 2, don't let this mechanic bother you too much though. The player can force a change of seasons by paying to do so at their bed in their player home. Additions also came to weapons. One thing I failed to mention in part 1 of this series was that each weapon may have an element associated with it. These elements included fire, water, thunder, and dragon. Monsters may be weak to one or several of these elements, and using them against them in battle will produce extra damage. On top of the ones already listed, there are also several elements where the point of them wasn't to offer extra base damage, but instead cause ailments. These elements included paralysis, which had the chance to paralyze an enemy for a short time and allow the player to attack unobstructed. Poison which could produce a damage over time effect, and sleep, which could put the enemy to sleep, allowing the player to set up traps or explosives. New to Monster Hunter 2 was the ice element, which would deal extra damage to those monsters who were weak to it. Along with the new elements, there were several new Blademaster weapons introduced to the series, including my personal favorite and main weapon, Longsword. Yes, I am a weeb, unfortunately. But are you trying to tell me that the Spirit Gauge wasn't the coolest concept in the series at the time? You couldn't even boost its level yet or use the Spirit Round Slash, and it was still incredibly gratifying to fill it up and get that 12% damage boost. On top of the Long Sword, Blade Masters also had access to the Hunting Horn and Gun Lance. The Hunting Horn was especially unique, allowing the player to play different combinations of notes to create a desired buff effect. Gunners also had access to the bow, which is a faster and more versatile weapon, allowing skilled hunters to take down monsters from a distance with ease. Some existing weapons also had various changes. For example, the iconic Greatsword Charge Attack was first introduced in 2. If you remember from my previous video, this was also retroactively added to Monster Hunter G when it was re-released on the Nintendo Wii. Sword and Shield also now had the ability to use items even while weapons were unsheathed in combat. Both armor and weapons had a new slot and decoration system introduced, where players could put decorations into an empty slot to boost specific skill points, to either unlock a skill or help boost it to its next tier of effectiveness. This gave the player more overall customization and control over the armor sets. Speaking of armor sets, players could now name and label the sets that they kept in their item box, allowing them to change equipment much easier. On top of this, armor was now upgraded similarly to how weapons were, requiring certain specific monster parts or gathering materials before being able to forge it to a higher level of effectiveness. So what about the monsters? Well, not only were there new additions, but every large monster from Monster Hunter G also returned for the next entry in the series. On top of that, there were two new monster classifications added. The Carapacean, crab-like creatures who can use other, larger monster skulls as their shells, and fanged beasts. Something interesting to note is that Bulfango, a monster who first appeared in the original game, is considered a fanged beast from this point forward, while simply being a herbivore in the previous entries. The following large monsters were introduced. Bulldrome, a monster that is similar to a large Bulfango. Kongalala and Blanganga, two ape-like creatures and the first of their kind in the series, as well as Rajang, 
an online-only ape-like creature. Daimyo Hermitar and Shogun Shianatar, two of the new Carapacean monsters introduced. The Daimyo wears the skull of a Monoblos, while the Shogun wears the skull of a Gravios. Shengao Ren, an extremely large Carapacean, is a special online-only monster that wears the skull of a Lao Shan Lung. Believe it or not, despite its size, it's not classified as an Elder Dragon. While neither named or classified as a monster in the game itself, there's a large shakalaka the player can hunt called King Shakalaka. What's a shakalaka? They're a type of Linnean creature similar to the felines found in Monster Hunter 1. By the release of Monster Hunter World, there are three types of Linians, and within those three, various subtypes. But we won't get into that until a later entry in the series. Various new Elder Dragons were also introduced into the series, including the flagship monster of Dos, Kushala Daura. On top of Kushala, there are the following new entries. Rusted Kushala, a variant of Kushala whose metallic skin has started to rust. This is not a subspecies, similar to how Scarred Yan Garuga in Freedom was not. It has small visual differences and may act slightly different in combat, with Rusted Kushala being more aggressive than its normal counterpart. Camellios, a jittery monster that has the ability to poison the player and steal their items, similar to Egyptsaros. Tiastra and Lunastra, an iconic Elder Dragon pair. Lunastra is an offline-only monster and appears in Monster Hunter 2's Endgame. White Fatalis, an online-only subspecies of Fatalis that appears white and glows similar to that of a Kirin. And finally, Yamasukami, a very unique looking Elder Dragon who appears as the endgame hunt for the online quest chain. Yama rarely appears in Monster Hunter games, and Western audiences would first get to hunt one with the release of Freedom Unite. On top of this, Lao Shan Lung and Kirin both had easily accessible offline quests, while Fatalis and its subspecies remained online only. Multiple new locations were also added to the series. These include Snowy Mountains. Desert, Jungle, Swamp, Volcano, Tower, and Town. Town is a part of the online hub town of Dundorma, and is a location usually used to fight Elder Dragons. Speaking of Dundorma, let's talk about hub areas. The main offline hub area in Monster Hunter 2 is Jumbo Village, a port village and location unique to Monster Hunter 2 specifically. The town has never made a reappearance in any future Monster Hunter games, only being mentioned by name in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. By completing various special requests, the player could upgrade various parts of the village, including the blacksmith or the player home. These upgrades would offer several benefits, such as the blacksmith opening up a shop that contained various supplies. The tavern is where the player will spend a good portion of their time, taking available quests depending on the season and participating in mini-games, such as arm wrestling against the Jumbo Arm Wrestler or drinking with the Wyverian Lady. Several shops exist in the town as well, including the feline merchant who sells general goods, a traveling merchant known as the Peddling Granny who shows up from time to time, and the blacksmith when upgraded. Items could be combined at the Combine Shopkeeper if the player had the proper recipe. Several items now also had multiple recipes making it easier to craft items. There is no kitchen in town, but there is a feline cook who will make various meals for you or your poogie when given the proper ingredients. There are also multiple gathering areas, including a fishing corner where the player can go to catch fish as long as they have bait, and a cave where they can provide a miner with a pickaxe to go collect various ores for them. Similar to the hero of Kokoto, there is the hero of Jumbo, who is known for slaying a Lunastra. This hero also has a sword and a stone for the player to obtain by upgrading their mining cave to level 3. Finally, if all requests for the shipyard manager have been completed and the Lunastra has been slayed, the player can travel to Kokoto Village for a visit. Similar to the online hub of Mineguard Town, Monster Hunter 2 has its own online hub known as Dundorma. Part of Dundorma is set up specifically to defend against various attacks from Elder Dragons. This hunting location is simply known as Town. Dundorma sports an item shop and blacksmith, as well as a guild hall, which is similar to the tavern, and where players will generally hang out and pick up quests. There are two people of note in the town, specifically his immenseness, an old, giant Wyverian, who is the leader of both Dundorma and the Elder Dragon Observation Team a corporation who focuses on finding Elder Dragons. Additionally, there is the Songstress, who can be found on a stage in Dundorma. 
The player can give the songstress a musical note in exchange for her singing a song. I don't have much else to say on Dundorma specifically, but it is important to note that while Monster Hunter 2's online servers have gone offline, Dundorma isn't completely lost. Rather, the town reappears in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, although not fully. Additionally, there are restoration efforts to get Monster Hunter 2's online component back up and running. Given the time, maybe I'll make a similar video to my Mineguard entry when that happens. Quests in Monster Hunter 2 function almost identically to previous entries in the series, however there are a few additions. For one, players now have access to subquests. These tasks would be tacked onto larger quests and would allow the player to complete the quest through an easier objective, meaning that they could end it sooner without losing any loot that they had already obtained. These would not mark the quest as completed however, meaning that they would still need to eventually be completed properly. Additionally, a wanted system was added that would reward the player with extra money if they hunted monsters that were currently wanted by the village. A quality of life feature was also added to offline quests, where the player can now properly pause the game if they needed a break from the action. There are a few more additions of note added to Monster Hunter 2, such as a USB connectivity functionality that would allow players to connect their PSP to Monster Hunter 2. Doing so would unlock a Yan Garuga quest for both games. One really interesting addition was the inclusion of a competitive player versus player system where players would face off against one another, each attempting to hunt one another's monster that they bring with them into the battle. It's hard to find reviews for Monster Hunter 2, but taking a look at the sales to date, the game has sold just over 500,000 copies, about 200,000 more than Monster Hunter 1 before it. Monster Hunter Freedom, a game released a year prior, sold roughly 1.3 million, over double the amount of Monster Hunter 2. This is most likely due to multiple factors, including Freedom's overseas release and portability. However, the next release in the series sold over a million more copies than Freedom, and truly put Monster Hunter on the map in Japan. Let's take a look. Monster Hunter Freedom 2, also known as Portable Second in Japan, is an interesting entry in the series. While Freedom was for the better part just a port of Monster Hunter G, Freedom 2 has multiple large changes and more additional monsters. One major change is the shift in location, substituting Jumbo Village for a new snow-based hub called Pokey Village. A lot of Freedom-specific features, such as farming, also make their return. It's for this reason that the game isn't considered a direct port of Monster Hunter 2, rather being called a portable update. Let's start with what's been removed. First of all, the entire season system has been stripped from the game, no longer locking the player out of various content. Day and night cycles also no longer technically exist. Rather than being dynamic, a quest will now inform the player if it takes place during day or night and adjust the map accordingly. Yamasukami has also been removed from the series. On top of that, the PvP mechanic introduced in 2 does not make a return either. On to the new hub, Pokey Village sported many of the amenities seen in Freedom, while lacking certain features that appeared in Monster Hunter 2. Specifically, the player could not upgrade the village or their player home. The farm makes a return, allowing players to gather various items such as bugs or ore. A change compared to freedom allows the player to farm without worrying about breaking their tools. However, tools will still break while out hunting and gathering. An adventurous feline named Trenya can also be sent out to help gather for hunters. Some of the items he can obtain are unique to him and cannot be gathered by the player. Returning to the game are the general store, as well as the blacksmith and armory, where the player can upgrade their equipment. The Feline Kitchen and Training School also make a reappearance, with the Training School being expanded on with additional quests allowing the player to train against the additional monsters. The Feline Kitchen is inaccessible until the player meets and hires Wandering Feline Chefs, which can be found by interacting with a Wandering Chef barrel near the player home or by speaking to the Peddling Granny. Speaking of the Peddling Granny, she makes her return from Monster Hunter 2, this time introducing the game's mascot pet Poogie to you. The Guild Hall appears in Pokey Village and is where the player will pick up their offline and online quests. Additionally, treasure hunts make a return and no longer require an additional party member. Main offline quests would still be picked up by the village elder outside of the guild hall. Players now also have the ability to connect to the internet to download additional quests, item packs, and poogie costumes. 
By the way, if you're wondering what that giant boulder behind the village elder is, it's Macalite. Three new monsters are introduced to the series with the release of Freedom 2. These include Geodrome, a large monster version of Gia Prey, which were introduced in Monster Hunter 2. Think of it as a winter variant of Velocidrome, without actually being called a variant. Akantor, a flying wyvern, but in name only, as he is considered flightless, despite this classification. And the flagship monster of Freedom 2, the Tigrex, a series regular and fairly popular monster, despite how excruciatingly difficult I found him in this series. Again, he was the reason I stopped playing Monster Hunter until the release of Try. There aren't many other changes to the series, though the tower location from Monster Hunter 2 does get a slight rework. Freedom 2 was a real turning point for the series in Japan, selling to date 2.4 million copies globally. In the West, the game received multiple 7 out of 10s and higher, with few lower than that. GameSpot notably gave the game a 5 out of 10. Despite this, the game sold fairly well in the West, and would go on to become a classic entry for the PSP. The game wouldn't see a lack of success with its next entry either. Let's take a look at Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. This is it, Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. A series classic and the best-selling entry on the PSP ever. Monster Hunter Freedom Unite was considered a critical success in Japan by Capcom, and it wouldn't be long until they brought it over to the West. It sported 1,500 different weapons and 2,000 armor sets, advertised over 500 hours of gameplay potential, and allowed players to transfer their Freedom 2 save over to Unite so they wouldn't lose progress. It was truly a masterclass entry in the series. One of the most notable additions was the introduction of the feline companion system, now typically known as Palicos. The player can hire up to 13 feline companions, but only have three of them set as active. Having companions set as active allows them to take part in training and better their skills in hunting and gathering. Comrades are limited to offline-only content and also cannot join the player when fighting exceptionally large creatures, such as Lao Shan Lung and Shen Gao Ren. Felines had multiple stats, such as attack and defense, and would even track the fondness they held towards the player. A feline would either use a slashing or impact weapon, and while the player could not change a comrade's equipment directly, as the comrade levels up, their weapon will show multiple visual differences. The player can use points to have their comrade learn up to three skills at a time, and have them unlearn skills when they want to switch them out. Players can even share their companions with friends through the PSP's sleep mode. The feline companion will keep track of who their original commander was. Freedom Unite once again offered multiple new monsters for the player to hunt, including multiple subspecies. These included Plum Damio Hermitar and Terra Shogun Shianitar. The Plum Damio wears a Diablo skull and sports a purple tone, while the Terra Shogun wears a black Gravio skull instead of a normal Gravios and sports a black and red tone. Next is Emerald Conga Lala, who appears green in color and is much more flatulent than its normal counterpart, and Copper Blanganga who is a larger and stronger subspecies of Blanganga that lives in hot desert regions, rather than in the Snowy Mountains area. Two new additions actually first debuted in Monster Hunter Frontier, those being Hypnocatrice and Lavasioth. While appearing in Munch of Frontier, Hypnocatrice would never appear in the main series again. Meanwhile, Lavasioth would appear in Cross, Double Cross, and Monster Hunter World. The Vespoid Queen, a large Neopteron monster, is introduced for the first time in Freedom Unite, Technically, there is a downloadable quest in Freedom 2, where the player fights an enlarged Vespoid called a Vespoid Queen, but this is simply a larger model of the Vespoid with more health and that inflicts greater damage. Eucanalos is also introduced in Freedom Unite, and has a special location to hunt in found in the Snowy Mountains called Snowy Mountains Peak. It resembles an Akantor. The flagship monster of the series is a brand new addition, the Nargakuga, another very popular monster in the series. Additionally, both Yamasukami and King Shakalaka make a return in this entry. A variant of Rajang is also introduced in Freedom Unite, called Furious Rajang. Furious Rajang starts off looking like your average enraged Rajang, but when going into rage mode, has its fur stand up and become visibly electrified. 
Many of the old monsters also have new attacks, as well as new telegraphs, making it easier to know when an enemy was going to attack a specific way, and plan accordingly. There are multiple little additions and quality of life changes, such as extra equipment pages. Instead of 6, the player now has 8 pages to use, with the ability to upgrade that number to 10. The player could also store more sets in total, as well as hold a maximum number of 99 of each item within a storage slot in the player's box. Players could even install part of the game's data onto a memory card for faster loading times. Additionally, the player could skip certain cutscenes such as the entry scenes for Fatalis and Lao Shan Lung. Guild cards also received an upgrade with multiple new pages which would allow various stats and feline information to be shown. There are also many new character customization options such as hair and starting clothes, and the addition of new music for areas and new downloadable quests. The game was basically packed to the brim with new features and additions. The game introduced many new weapons and armor sets thanks to the inclusion of the new monsters. Some of these armor sets even had unique skills that could not be obtained from decorations. Some weapons received several changes as well. For example, some dual blades could sport two elements rather than one, and the hunting horn added the ability to produce a sonic bomb effect. With these new weapons and additions came a brand new sharpness level. To date, Purple Sharpness is the highest level of sharpness that can be obtained for any weapon in almost any Monster Hunter game, except for Frontier, which added the Sky Blue Sharpness, which is one level higher than Purple. G-Rank Quests marked their return with the release of Freedom Unite. This is because Freedom Unite is a direct expansion of Freedom 2. In Japan, the games are called Portable 2nd and Portable 2nd G, respectively. These quests can be picked up from the new guild clerk in the guild hall. Certain first generation locations saw their return and existing locations such as forests and hills now have the ability to be in either day or night. The volcanic region was also upgraded, adding two new areas to the map. Finally, the game introduced epic hunting quests, where the player would hunt multiple monsters one after the other. Carving these monsters wouldn't produce materials, but would instead reward the player with mega potions. However, quest rewards would still be monster materials, meaning that the player could capture monsters for rarer rewards. Freedom Unite sold exceptionally well globally for a PSP game, racking in 3.8 million sales to date. It would even see a digital release on the PS Vita, with the inclusion of right analog stick functionality for the camera controls, finally ending the need to use the infamous claw grip. As of writing this, it is the third best selling game on the PSP. Western reviews of this game were slightly better than Freedom 2, with a Metacritic score averaging above the 80s. Wow. Okay, that was a lot of information for a brief history entry, and there's definitely even more I could have gotten into. But why not try the game yourself? Dust off that old PSP, or that Vita, and check out Freedom Unite, one of the pillars of quality in the Monster Hunter series. In the next part of this series, we'll be looking at the third generation of Monster Hunter, including Portable 3rd, Try, and Ultimate, which are some of my favorite games and include some of my favorite monsters, including the best boy, Lugia Cruz. If you enjoyed this video and found it informative, consider supporting the channel by liking, commenting, and subscribing. Again, it only takes a couple of seconds and helps support me in my goal of creating this content for you all. I try to respond to every comment I can, so if you want to hear from me, be sure to let me know. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video. Hey, you made it to the end of the video. That means so much to me. And uh, really, it's just so amazing and awesome. And I really do appreciate it. You're probably wondering why I'm here again. And it's because within the video, there are a couple little things that I just wanna point out to you uh, due to a couple inaccuracies and just, just some things that I feel need a little bit of clarification. To start off, there's the peddling granny that shows up in Freedom 2 and Freedom Unite. There's actually two grannies there and I don't know which one's supposed to be considered the peddling granny. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the one that sells you the items, but there's also one near your house that also gives you all the feline chefs, so I wasn't completely sure. If you know the answer and you wanna clarify that for me, feel free to do that in the comments. That would be swell. I kind of made it seem like the Poogie costumes only started to show up in Freedom 2, but that's not the case. If you watch the footage that I recorded, you can actually see that in Monster Hunter 2, you can get custom Poogie costumes. I think they're actually the same costumes being worn in Freedom 2 and Monster Hunter 2 in my footage. This was actually an, an issue in the wiki and I had to correct it. Uh, Epic hunts first show up in Freedom 2. They don't show up in Freedom Unite first. I already recorded the audio segment for that and I didn't want to re-record it. So I thought I would just come on now and let you know that 
that was wrong. That was incorrect. And it has been remedied. A second correction is that I said Forest and Hills finally got nighttime in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, I think, but that's not the case. It actually already had nighttime in Monster Hunter 2. It just didn't show up in Freedom 2 and then made its return in Freedom Unite. I added a little correction within the video editing for this part, but just to clarify, you can actually change the look of your Palico's armor. Also, I don't know why I didn't mention this in the video when talking about Freedom 2 and Freedom Unite and the weapon changes. One of the things to talk about is the fact that the longsword now has an infinite combo because they added the ability to use the buttons instead of the right analog stick because there's no right analog stick on the PSP. And yeah, that is the first appearance of the infinite combo in Monster Hunter unless it showed up in Frontier somewhere, but I don't think it did. So yeah, that's a really cool fact. Anyway, that's the end of my little segment where I fix all of the wrongs I made. If I missed anything else or got anything else wrong, let me know. Please feel free to comment, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe. That would be great. Okay, goodbye.